Hello, we're here with Seattle City Council candidate, Brianna Thomas, and she's running for position number nine. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yeah, thank you so much for having me here this evening. I'm Brianna Thomas, um, and I am on my second run for Seattle City Council. And a lot of folks have been like, why would you do that twice? Well, here's why. Um, I lost the first time I ran, and I had the great opportunity to work with the council for the last five and a quarter years and really get an upfront seat on what the job is that I'm asking for. I think the first time I ran, I had some big ideas and a big vision and some theories of change. I just didn't have the ticky tacky knowledge about how to make those changes into actual policies. And that's what I've been learning for the last five years. Um, I'm running right now because I think our city needs a little bit of know-how and a little bit of reason and a little bit more grace than we've seen in our political dialogue the last few years. Um, it's been it's been tough out there. And I think as Democrats, we are a big tent party. And that's my hope is to be a candidate that builds a strong coalition that brings back collaboration and gets us all remembering how much we care about each other. Big three issues for me are criminal justice reform, which folks normally pigeonhole into just SPD issues, but it's not just SPD, it's our city attorney's office and how we work with them, our municipal courts, and the folks over at the county, all working in Congress to uh, come up with a less racially biased outcome carceral system that we know doesn't actually provide for more public safety. Uh, second of all, I'm working for an economic recovery that is equitable for our city. I think a lot of folks are in a hurry to get back to business as usual post pandemic, but we've got to remember that business as usual wasn't actually working for everyone. We've got a really rare opportunity here to reset how we do things in the city and make sure that we are really truly bringing everyone along. And then third of all, I would like to build a sustainable future um, as we grow and face the continued uh, challenges of the environmental crisis. Folks are going to keep moving here, and we have an opportunity right now to build a greener Seattle for tomorrow, and I sure hope we can seize it, and I hope we can do it together. Great. Thank you. So now we're going to move into the prepared questions, and again, these responses are two minutes in length. And I just posted the first one into the chat and it looks like our, our order for questions is Mackenzie, Alice, Sherry, then Jeff. So Mackenzie, would you like to go ahead with question one? Sure, thank you. Uh, what specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and the long term? Uh, please address land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, the role of the police and the justice system, et cetera. In two minutes, Roger that. Okay, so I think where we've got to start is acknowledging the fact that part of the reason we're here right now have been exclusionary zoning practices in the past. Um, there's been a bit of an attitude in parts of our city that they don't want affordable housing or density in folks' backyard. And now we are seeing that homelessness is everywhere in our town, and it is indeed in our backyards and in our parks and on our sidewalks. And we can't simply accept encampments as our default answer. So the first thing we gotta do is get serious about getting folks inside, whether that's hotels, expansion of tiny house uh, villages, which I'm gonna say on the record really clear is not a permanent solution. We need to work toward a permanent solution um, or expanded shelter services. Step one is getting folks inside because it is not compassionate to have families living in tents all over our town. Um, Mid-range solution is getting the King County Regional Housing Authority up and running. I found it very frustrating personally to watch the 18 month process that it was to stand that up, get the bylaws passed, get the governing committee uh, moving in the same direction, get a CEO hired, and then have some of our neighbors uh, in our region decide that they were going to continue to criminalize homelessness and also not, not cite supportive services or solutions. This isn't a Seattle problem. Homelessness is a national problem. It certainly is a regional problem. And we need our regional partners at the table contributing to solutions. Third of all, we definitely need to take a look at our land use and how we're going to create infill and density that also concurrently creates affordable housing. Single family exclusionary zoning um, has uh, unfortunately left us in a smaller, smaller pockets of where affordable housing is occurring. And I don't think it's one neighborhood's burden to bear. I think that these are our neighbors. This is our community. And we should find affordable housing everywhere we find a vibrant community, which is 118 neighborhoods in this town. Great. Thank you so much. And now we'll move into question number two. And Alice. What is your strategy for creating 
dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing. How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements, including uh, such as redlining, uh, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? And then sort of a corollary question, do you support and would you sponsor city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? Okay, so what we've got to do is make sure that while we're looking at our land use policies, we are not continuing to uh, focus density in the communities that have already been systemically disenfranchised and concentrating poverty. I think we have to have a real conversation that diversity in our communities creates resilient communities, thriving communities, and prosperous communities. Housing equals the ability for folks to move into economic stability, and Seattle's got a wealth gap like most towns have never seen. So in order to get folks to close that gap, We've got to get them housed. We've got to get them stabilized. Um, I absolutely think that Seattle's got a long way to go to come to a realization and a reckoning of its redlining past and its exclusionary zoning. It is harmful and it is in the dirt that we all walk on every day. Um, and until we accept that and attempt to make reparations for policies passed, we're not going to get very far. Um, in terms of the complete elimination of single family zoning in one fell swoop, I got to be honest with you, I just don't think I could, I don't think you'd be responsible to support a policy that one, I haven't read yet, and two, I'm not sure how it would apply to our topography, our communities, and where we actually need to cite additional density to get the affordable housing that we need. What I do know, however, is there's some neighborhoods that haven't quite participated in the inclusion of all of our communities, and we're going to have to have those conversations. I don't think that um, the dream of yesteryear in Seattle past is what should be driving our future. We've got to recognize we are a global city. We are getting people from all over the planet, not just the country coming here. And we should be excited about making room for them. And with that room includes affordability. I'm also a huge fan of workforce housing. Like give me a multi-generational affordable apartment, please. Somebody, my kingdom for a three bedroom that a working family can actually afford in this town that's transit oriented. This should be exciting. This shouldn't feel like a burden. Great. Thank you so much. And now we're going to move into question number three. And I believe that is Sherry. Are you, you ready, Sherry? Oh, I think she might have dropped off. Uh, let's go to Jeff. All right, would you decrease the Seattle Police Department budget? And if so, by approximately what percentage? What is your plan for the city's SPOG negotiations? And do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? Okay, big question. So uh, TLDR answer, I don't think there's a predetermined percentage and I don't think it's reasonable to pretend that there is. We're in a tight spot. We still have the consent decree. It's a hundred paragraphs of mandates, not suggestions by the federal government, who we are still paying to oversee our police operations on an annual multi-million dollar basis. The other parallel and challenge that we have is the collective bargaining agreement. You know, I actually got to work on the 2017 police accountability ordinance all beautiful 107 pages of it. Um, and I think we got about two thirds of the meat and potatoes into this CBA, but we didn't get all of it. We didn't get arbitration and we didn't get changes to how discipline is meted out and civilian engagement. And that was the point of that exercise. So until I'm able to sit at a table with Spog, meaningfully talk about what reform looks like, meaningfully talk about what retention of young and diverse officers look like, and meaningfully talk about culture change, that the community can feel that's not just a data point, we're not gonna get anywhere. So pontificating on a, on a percentage doesn't feel like a real thing to me. What we have to do is re-establish community trust. We were recently worked on a piece of policy to minimize the use of less lethal weapons. You're thinking tear gas, you're thinking flashbangs. Um, and you know the court and the DOJ reminded us that we are still in their purview. So until we fulfill the commitments of the consent decree, and until we get a collective bargaining agreement that actually respects the calls from community for non-biased, non-violence, non-predatory policing, 30 seconds. we aren't going to be able to reestablish that, establish that trust. Now, do we absolutely need to move money into community-based solutions? Totally, thousand percent, hundred percent, 
definitely need to do that. And I'm proud of the work I got to do with the council that did just that to the tune of about $112 million. But we also have to make sure that those solutions are sustainable and we're not setting community up for a failed pilot project that frees all of us from any obligation to continue this work. Great, thank you so much. And now we're gonna to move to question four. Sarah, are you available? I am. Thank you. Um, how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars? Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? Okay. Just reading, thinking, reading, thinking. I think it is hard to say which of these you would prioritize funds for because it's the same street. Right, we're all operating on the same grid and they've got to work together. If I'm in a room with the longshoremen, they're going to expect me to say that transit corridors, particularly around um, our industrial lands, are the most important. And if I'm in Delridge, they're going to say that uh, sidewalks are most important. If I'm in the North End, they're going to say that both and they need bikes and sidewalks and have been pleading for both forever. And that's most important. And I think the thing, the trick about governance is understanding the tension between competing priorities competing asks and working in coalition, which is the thing we used to do really, really, really well here to get to those solutions. So I was talking to a gig worker the other day who said that the safe streets has been really helpful for them being able to have prioritized access as they are making money on a platform job. Also parking in front of restaurants for pickup and drop off. So that's something we can actually consider making permanent so that these low wage employees moving about town can have access to a more reasonable economy because a uh, TLDR and a preview gig worker pay up standards are coming to a town near you and making sure that those jobs actually pay and these streets are working for all of us. I think either or propositions are dangerous in politics because it leads candidates to accidentally make promises that they can't keep. What I can tell you is I will work with transit advocates, I will work with bicycle advocates and pedestrian safety advocates to make sure that these streets are working for all of us. Um, sidewalk cutouts, huge, huge, huge in terms of accessibility. It's not just bicycles, it's folks that maybe need a little bit of help moving around town that maybe they are in wheelchairs or they've got a scooter they're trying to use or they're a mom running an errand with a, with a stroller. Like, Infrastructure safety investments don't work for the folks that are on the margin. They work for all of us. When you've got safe communities and you're able to move about with uh, planning that has an eye toward equity, it builds a better community for all of us. Great. And also okay. the answer to everything is revenue. Revenue that the chamber won't sue to death is always the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, now we'll go into our follow-up questions for, um, from our board and the responses to these would be one minute apiece. Um, and uh, looks like Sarah got her hand up. So go ahead, Sarah. Hi, you talked about sustainability and this question is from our environmental caucus in the 36th district. So how would you use your office to address climate justice, ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions such as multimodal clean transportation options for Seattle city residents? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things that's really inspiring about being a citywide candidate is that you do get to think about the entire city and its communities. And I remember the first time I ran, I learned that the life expectancy of the children in South Park and their was 17 years shorter than folks who live in Ravenna or Magnolia. 17 years off your life based on where you live because you don't have access to clean air and you're living next to a polluted river. I mean, that's simply unacceptable and we have to make sure all of our environmental protections and policies are put through a racial equity and justice lens because it turns out people of color have been paying the cost the whole time. Um, you know, I think that building infrastructure that allows for multimodal and getting folks out of their cars and into transportation is the way to go because, you know, greenhouse gases are on the rise and it turns out cars are the number one culprit until we change human behavior and make it accessible and not just and desirable to use these alternatives, then we're not going to see the substantive changes that we need. So I'm all for a multimodal system that is accessible to all. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. Yes, thank you. Uh, so a question I have is um, the Clean Campaigns Act was introduced by Councilmember Gonzalez in 2019. And 
I'm just going to assume that you probably had a hand in that being that uh, that you worked with Gonzalo. Uh, my question is, do you have any plans to act on that any further and uh, build on it or any ideas to make local elections uh, more fair when it comes to financing uh, campaigns under, especially under the weight of Citizens United? Well, Mackenzie, luckily, I am an innovator in this space. I was also the campaign manager for Honest Elections, which brought us the Democracy Voucher Program, which really opened up who could run and who had a voice in our elections. Um, there are limitations to the Clean Campaigns Act, but I think that working in partnership with our progressive community on what that looks like is the next step. I think we got as far as we could on our own. And to be honest with you, there was quite a bit of pushback. There are folks who are benefiting from the system working as as it does, including in our progressive community. Um, and so I think that making sure that those voices are centered and that we, again, are working in coalition. I know I sound like a broken record, but it's a thing I'm actually really into because governing is a team sport. And that's what Seattle prefers. Seattle prefers voices at the table working together. Um, in terms of Citizen United, you know, my kingdom for an overturn, <laughs> an overturnment that recognizes that corporations aren't people. But I think that the work that the Clean Campaigns Act was able to translate to at the state level was really a, a big step and a first step for us thinking about a regional approach to how our campaigns are run and local control. Great, thank you. Mary Kiley. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak about what you see as your role as a city council um, member in protecting like disability rights for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, or those with physical disabilities throughout the city. Yeah, so I've got a friend who is much smarter than I am, luckily, I have several of those. Um, her name's Christiana Obey Sumner, and she got me hip to the fact that intersectionality is the starting point and not a burden or an afterthought. If as a policymaker, I am thinking about what it might be like to be a physically uh, disabled woman of color, you know, that maybe isn't an English speaker and maybe isn't documented and maybe is exploring where they are in their gender spectrum, you know, if I make a community that works for that person, we all benefit and it's not a burden, it's a privilege to think that way. It's a privilege to build policy from that perspective. In terms of the built environment, I think we can continue to work on accessibility issues throughout the city, um, whether again, it's sidewalk cutouts or simply, you know, like a language translation or talking, talking buttons um, at intersections, making sure, also colorblind folks, I think they get looked over a lot, but a lot of our, our wayfinding signs are still not terribly accessible to the folks that are colorblind. So really, it, it really is centering the person who is the end user in an intersectional lens that comes up with the best policy. Great, thank you. Any additional follow-ups? Mackenzie. Sure, thanks. Uh, I have a question for you about universal basic income. I'm curious of your thoughts on that, if that's something that uh, you would be interested in trying to implement, and if so, if you have any plans for that, and uh, especially how to fund it, if so. Yeah, again, Mackenzie, the answer to a lot of these questions is a sustainable progressive revenue stream that isn't caught up in litigation. I think there's a, a huge onus on candidates to have answers to questions that are perennial problems. I assure you have the emotional scar tissue from surviving three rounds of the employee hours tax fight, three rounds in three years. It's once a year we've had this conversation and our, our run at capital gains and our run at income tax. We have to have a working coalition that comes up with a policy that doesn't end up in litigation. I can write a beautiful economic vision for the world and if it gets stuck in King County or Superior Court, nothing happened. So my solution to a revenue stream that's, that's progressive and not regressive is going back to the table and doing the work to make sure we are bringing people together and that those who can are contributing. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are at one minute now. Um, so uh, if you would like, you may go ahead and give a wrap up. Thank you for having me. It is really hard to try to get your mind around multi-generational problems with two minute answers, 20 minutes at a go all over town, but thank goodness we've got Zoom. I appreciate that you care about your community. I appreciate that you're taking the time on an evening. I just wanna remind you, I am proud to be a Democrat. 
there's nothing wrong with it. Shout it from the rooftops. And I think that us being the party of a big tent really can go back to bringing people together and elevating our shared values and reminding each other that we do care about each other. We have more in common than we have different. And I'm no longer accepting the narrative that my city's best days are behind her. It's a gorgeous, innovative, wonderful place that I'm proud to call home. And I hope to earn your support. Great. Thank you so much.